how do you describe this moment? I, compared to maybe to five years ago, or not compared, but how do you describe the moment we are in right now, meaning this election year, going into this 2020 election year? Sure. Well, when I met Congressman Cummings, uh, Obama was the president. And uh, I think there was a sense that change had really come to this country and that a lot more was possible. Uh, just a few short years later, uh, our entire political landscape changed. And it wasn't that um, the, those uh, activities weren't happening before, but uh, that movement took power in this country in a way that um, has completely changed our everyday lives and it's completely changed the political landscape. What that means for us right now is that we have a mandate to make sure that we um, fight for the soul of this country. And, um, you know, as somebody who is sometimes skeptical of whether or not this project can work, I'm very skeptical of it. Um, I'm, I'm able to suspend skepticism, understanding that what's at stake right now um, is our actual futures. Like, the progress of the problems that are plaguing this country have accelerated since this administration took power. Um, and what's really at stake is not just the issues that I care about, but my ability to be able to make decisions over my life and the people I care about and the people I love. And I'm not willing to give that up without a fight. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. Who are we, who are we up against? I don't think this is a fight between Democrats and Republicans. I don't think this is a fight between the left and the right. I think this is a fight for um, the moral center of this project that we're trying to build together. And whether that be you know, the project of America or something else that we dream of, um, I think the fight right now is around, um, it's, it's extreme extremism versus um, uh, dignity. Right, and um, we have a set of extremists in the White House right now who um, not only are hell bent on rolling back everything that you and I have fought for, uh, that my mother fought for, that my grandmother fought for, my grandmother's grandmother fought for, um, but they are also hell bent on making sure that never again can you and I make decisions about what happens to us in our lives. Um, they are content with making sure that people with money um, get to control how decisions are made, they get to control what decisions are made, and they get to control who gets to participate. And I think that that is a major threat to the future of all of us. In 2016, I was at this very same conference, mm -hmm. and it was clear that some people were coming in to this moment, which was the beginning of the Trump administration, thinking, okay, we just have to do what we do better and bigger. bigger. There were other people coming in saying, no, no, game changed. Yep. This is a five alarm fire moment. Yeah. This is no time for business as usual. Yeah. Where are you in that discussion? I, I, I'm in a lot of places. I knew that Donald Trump was going to get elected and I had no illusions about that. And the reason I had no illusions about that was because while some of us were talking about populism on the left, the right was building a populist movement that won power in this country. And I have never been mistaken uh, that this is bigger than Donald Trump. This is about a, um, a deep schism that has widened uh, to the point where uh, there has to be a different way of moving forward. We actually have to articulate who we are again. Um, and so there's that. Uh, I do not think that we can just work harder and things are gonna change. I don't think that if we change who's in the White House, things are gonna change. There is so much damage that has been done um, that we are in a very different moment. And to undo the damage that has been done is going to take us at least a decade. But to be honest, things were not great before this administration took power. And so what we actually have to heal right now is people's um, complete disgust with government and its inability to meet the needs of its citizens. We have to um, heal the deep trauma that people have around the corruption that has surrounded politics for my whole life. Um, and we also have to figure out how we solve some of the biggest problems facing America and how we do it together and how we do it in ways that um, I don't think we've really imagined yet. 
um, it is not going to be sufficient for us to uh, just think that getting a new president in the White House and then giving power back to the Democrats is what is going to make this country better. Um, it will stop the bleeding for a little bit, but um, there is hemorrhaging happening here. When Black Lives Matter took off, it took off globally. And we talked about how it was in many ways a global movement. And as you and others traveled around, you found connections all across the world. Yeah. Um, what is the state of, what are the state of those connections at this point? And where do you place us in global struggle as we see things blowing up from Haiti to Ecuador to Chile to Europe? Sure, well, I, I mean, if anything, um, what we're seeing in countries across the world is also deep unrest. That populist movement um, hasn't just taken power here, it's taking power all over, the, all over the globe. And at the same time, a deep resistance is brewing. And I think our relationships are deepening. People are making the connections between what's happening um, in Chile and what's happening in Venezuela and trying to actually also pull apart well, how do we deal with some of the contradictions around the visions that we've that we've tried to move, and how do we prevent corruption even in our movements, right? Um, but I also think that we're getting very, very clear that power takes many forms, and you know, as, as I have been trained as an organizer, I've always been told that the power is in the people, and I deeply believe that, and that's what I do every single day. But there are many ways that we have to wield that people power. And one of the things that I know is that I think we're all struggling, right, with this question of what does it mean for those of us who have not had power to actually take it? Um, and can we transform it if we take it? And what models do we have for that, right? I mean, I used to look to Brazil for that. I said, oh my God, the Workers' Party took power in Brazil. And they did, and they still are building power. And also the reality is, right, that um, we are scared to take power because of what power do, can do to movements, um, what power can do to grassroots efforts that have been pushing an alternative vision for a long time. At the same time, we can be scared and we can also push forward. We can learn the lessons of mistakes that have been made and we can also commit ourselves to making new mistakes. And so that is what I wake up thinking about every single day. How do we make new mistakes? I think a lot about the assassination of Mariela Franco in Brazil, as given that you mentioned her. In that, that moment reflected two things. One, incredible state violence against an up and coming intersectional, trans, queer, out, working class, black Brazilian activist, leader. Yes. But it also provoked a global response, the like of which I've never seen. Correct. I don't know whether you want to talk about her, but how do you connect your work around Black Lives Matter and police violence and the carceral state and this other work that you're talking about mm -hmm. around healing and elections and yeah. and dealing with trauma. It's all one and the same. So uh, when Black Lives Matter first emerged, uh, it emerged around issues of state sanctioned violence, the most visible of which was police violence. And we would constantly say state violence takes many, many forms. It's not just about policing, but policing is the thing that we're all paying attention to because it's being captured on cell phones around the world. I think with Marielle's murder, uh, we're starting to understand that the state uses violence to contain and control, uh, particularly when there are these deep levels of schisms and resistance to abuse and exploitation. Uh, the fact that people cannot make a wage here that will allow them to take care of a family um, creates a level of insecurity that um, uh, gets people in motion. Right? When you can't feed your family, right? you want to figure out what you can do about it. Uh, and the state uses violence to crush that kind of rebellion. And so whether it be leaders like Marielle who dared to offer not only a different vision for where Brazil could go, but also to call out the corruption in the government, that's why she was murdered. Um, when you look at assassinations that happen around the world of not only activists but elected officials. Um, it is to quell the resistance that inequality generates. And I think 
we don't see it that way in the United States because we think we're the center of the universe and that um, nothing is as bad here as it is everywhere else. Um, and in some ways that's true because of the way that the United States controls everybody else's economy. But I think we should be very mindful that um, the conditions that we thought were third world conditions are here right now. Um, so I live in California. Uh, I was you know, off on a trip and I was reading about rolling blackouts that were happening uh, in the richest city in the nation, right? How is it that in the San Francisco Bay Area, the home of venture capital and tech capital, that people could be without power? And they were saying six to eight days maybe. That's creeping up on what people deal with every single day. Oh, six to eight days maybe in Puerto Rico actually ends up being three to four months where you have no power, right? Um, and that is because of the increasing control of corporations over our government and the increasing relinquishment that our government gives to corporations to do whatever they want and to line their pockets and to not regulate them. That is the agenda of our opposition, to let markets run free, um, to let CEOs pad their pockets as much as they want at the expense of you and me. And so um, you and I talking like this is a privilege that we have now, but I can tell you um, from the last six years of Black Lives Matter that you know people putting out their political views on Facebook, which has been in the news this week, uh, does get you visited by the FBI. And for some people, um, it gets them disappeared. And for others, um, it gets them murdered. And so all of these things are related. This deep level of economic insecurity, this deep level of material insecurity, and the rebellion that rises from that, um, state violence is used as, an, as a way to control and contain that. And if they have to kill you, they will. Last question. Who's the we that you're working with at this point? If we say that we have to go into this election year with a long vision and a movement building strategy and whatever, whatever we say, um, who is the we? And is that just about political candidates? Is it? No. We are in a real predicament. I mean, here we are at the Congressional Progressive Caucus, and I just keep saying to myself, there are not enough people who identify as progressive. And so this conversation in these rooms has to go into communities everywhere across this nation. And that's what it's gonna take to motivate and activate people to be active participants in their own lives. Most of what we're taught before we get sucked into this movement, if we're lucky enough to, um, is that things are the way they are and that you have to endure it. And most people in this country think they just have to endure it. And they're looking at 20 candidates on the Democratic side and going, who's gonna make sure that I can take care of my parents? Who's gonna make sure that if I get sick, that my family's gonna be okay? Who's gonna make sure that I'm not gonna get deported when I try to leave work today, right? Um, that's the things that people are looking for and I think, um, when I say we, I mean all of us who share the notion that things have to be different, but it's actually for me bigger than the progressive movement. It has to be about how do we bring in more people who don't use those labels to describe themselves, who don't get to talk about and debate ideas with each other you know, each day. How do we get those folks to say, I want to be active, an active agent in my own life and in the change that I want to see happen? And that, I think, is the biggest question facing us for the next 370-something days. If we have, don't figure out not only how to get people to the polls, but also how to protect people's right to use the polls, um, we are in for a really tumultuous couple of decades. You have beautiful June Jordan's lines written on your chest. Sure do. She wrote, all life is possible. You wrote, Black Lives Matter. We continue to live in a society that ranks lives valued to less valued. Are we getting it yet that this is a life question? Does a life matter question? Do we believe it? Um, that all yes and no. That yes and no. Do we, be, do we believe <coughs> it that all life is possible? And do we believe it that what's at stake here are our lives? I think the challenge right now is um, moving us toward a place where we don't just think about our own lives 
and we live in a country that encourages us to in engage in the Hunger Games, right? And so when we look at um, the vitriol against immigrants in this country, when we look at the continued vitriol against women in this country, when we look at the continued vitriol against anyone who is deemed um, different in this country, it's because we've been taught that um, somebody else is taking what is, is, is mine. And I hope that where we're moving is that we recognize that not only is all life valuable, but that we can't live without each other, right? And so in some ways, you know, when people say all lives matter, what they're really saying is I don't wanna talk about anybody who's different because they think they have special privileges. And that is a, that's a, an extremist message, right? But if we say all lives matter because we need each other to survive, that's a completely different message. So I'm hoping that that's where we're getting while being able to see each of us deeply in our humanity and what it means for me to live in this world as a black queer woman and to sit across from you as a white queer right, woman. How do we recognize that like, I can't live a good life if you're not living a good life? And what do we do to actualize that? And that our lives are at stake. A hundred percent. But if I think that if I can just get ahead and leave you behind, that that's what's gonna solve it. You'd be lonely. We're not gonna make it. <laughs> We're not gonna make it. So that's where I think we are. But I have a deep level of optimism that we're getting there and it might be um, by force and not by altruism, but shit, as long as we get there. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs>